welcome everyone. Good morning, welcome. Thanks everyone for joining. It's great to have you here. I wanted to just say a quick hello. My name is Stefan Bodeker. I use he, him pronouns and I oversee the admissions at Columbia GSAP. It's really great to have you join us this morning in, I, I always have to qualify in New York in the morning. I don't know where you're joining from. It's probably a different time zone for some of you. We have registrations from a number of different countries and continents. So um, there are definitely some good afternoons and good evenings uh, warranted as well. It's great to have you. Thanks for taking the time to join us for this uh, information session with Professor Jorge Otero Pilos, who directs the uh, Master of Science in Historic Preservation program at the school. And this is part of our open house uh, event series, our virtual open house. We've had a series of um, info sessions uh, led by different program directors and uh, some student sessions and uh, a virtual visit page. And I hope that you all have, uh, you should have received emails with those links. I will share them a little bit later on in the chat as well for, for additional resources we have on our website. I wanted to mention just before we get started, before I turn it over, uh, to just mention that the, the focus today in this session is on the curriculum, is on the academic experience in historic preservation. If you have questions about the admissions process, a little bit more kind of operational questions about your application and, uh, and how to put that together, we host regular sessions uh, dealing with those questions. And the next one is actually exactly a week from today, next Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern, and I encourage you to, to register for that. I will be hosting that to, to talk you through the requirements and, and kind of what you need to think about as you, as you prepare the application. And with that, I am very happy, Jorge, to turn it over to you. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time yourself to host this session. My pleasure. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to welcome you all to to this virtual um, orientation. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the historic preservation program, and then we're gonna have some questions. So please, you know, as I'm talking, write down your questions and then we'll make little time, you know, uh, for us to, to have a little discussion. I'm sure you have uh, a ton of questions. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and, um, and let's see if I can do that. Um, and you tell me, Stefan, I'm relying on you to tell me whether this is working properly. That's working. Uh, we, you just need to go to presentation mode and we can see. Uh, hang on, because the, the presentation mode button is hiding behind, there we go, behind everybody's little picture. Can you see that now? That's perfect. It looks good, thanks. Okay, great. So here we are, the, the preservation program, a little view of Columbia's uh, main quadrangle, which is just a beautiful space design by McKimmid and White. And um, in that, if you see the little arrow, that is where we are over there on the uh, right to the right of the dome, um, right there. Let me uh, show you the main building. Where, where we are, this is Avery Hall. Now the school was spread out or, around a number of buildings and we can talk about that in a second, but basically this is, this is the main hall where we are. And the most important thing I would say to know about the historic preservation program, obviously is the campus, but, obvious, but the most important thing I think is the faculty. So let me just tell you a little bit about the faculty. Um, in our program, we have full-time faculty a very strong full-time faculty and adjunct faculty. And in the full-time faculty, um, there's my colleague, Andrew Dolcard. His specialty is architectural history. He's an architectural historian, um, world-renowned historian of, uh, of New York City, and uh, one of the foremost preservationists in, in New York City. He's written a number of books on historic preservation, on different buildings of New York, uh, the Tenement Museum with which he was very involved, um, Morningside Heights, uh, our own Morningside Heights. Uh, he's written on row houses and he uh, has written as well on um, LGBTQ history. He is one of the um, 
really at the forefront of a whole movement to preserve the sites of LGBTQ history in New York. He created the New York City LGBTQ Historic Sites Project with a number of um, graduates of our historic preservation program. And, you know, while this today might seem kind of like something that you would think would be uh, already, you know, these sites would already be protected, it's really, um, it's really still work that that is ongoing and is really very much at the fore, forefront of the of the um, of the discipline. And Andrew really led that effort to to broaden historic preservation, to uh, for it to be more inclusive, more just, um, and a better representation of who we really are um, as humans and as um, as a nation. And so he was behind the designation of the Stonewall Inn and a number of other properties, but this is ongoing work, very exciting work, just to give you a taste of the kind of thing that he does. Now also, um, Andrew leads the Studio One, and I will talk about that in a second, and you'll get a, a, a feel for what that is. The other full-time faculty is Erica Avrami, who is uh, a planner and comes at preservation from that policy perspective, that social justice perspective, and also the question of sustainability. And so, you know, she's done a tremendous amount of work both in the United States and abroad. She was for 20 years at the World Monuments Fund leading their, their projects abroad and really brings in this idea to, to, the, to the teaching of community engaged research that you really have to think about the values that the people in the community that those monuments are being used by uh, hold and to understand that and that as preservationists, we often have to talk um, for those people, you know, ventriloquize their, um, their needs and, and wants and then help them accomplish them through our various toolkits. Uh, there's obviously uh, me. Um, I work, uh, I'm, I'm trained as an architect, uh, practice as an artist and think of art as a method for preserving. Uh, and work within a group of people who, uh, who advance the question of experimental preservation. This idea of, of art as a method for preservation has become a kind of broader uh, concern within, within the field, and we you know, refer to it as, as experimental preservation. And also in experimental preservation, thinking about the uh, connection, the emotional connection, but also the aesthetics of preservation. Ed preservation is a creative field, I think that that's one of our, you know, distinguishing factors here at Columbia that we really think of preservation as an act of changing the world. And we do it through different interventions in historic monuments. So this is one of my projects. This is a project that um, I did at the British Parliament. This is the entrance to the British Parliament. It's called Westminster Hall. At the end is the entrance to the uh, House of Lords and to the left, the, the House of Commons. And you can see here, this is a, a cleaning project. In fact, I cleaned the interior um, and transferred the dust that we collected from the cleaning to these latex sheets. And so the process of preservation itself becomes a mode of expression and a mode of connecting to the broader public to think about history and connection to place. And so that also translates into all sorts of different projects that I do internationally. So this, for example, is the uh, preservation of the old US embassy in Oslo, which the US sold and which I'm currently engaged in as part of a large team in preserving. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, range of faculty that teach uh, required and elective courses they range from engineers, uh, preservation engineers like Tim Michels, uh, preservation architects like Francois Boulac, uh, Paul Bentel, uh, uh, and Theodore Proudhon. Theodore Proudhon is also the, the founding director of the Society for the Documentation and, and Conservation of Modern Buildings. Uh, Richard Piper, who is a metals conservator. Mary Jablonski, who is interior finishes conservator. Norman Weiss who is um, an expert on masonry uh, conservation. Morgan O'Hara, who works with Mass Design Group and is really part of this uh, planning and preservation policy um, uh, and, and emphasis. 
Carolina Castellanos, who um, joins us from Mexico uh, every year, who is an expert on international heritage management. Uh, Shelby Green, who uh, is an expert on legal uh, matters and preservation. Amanda Trianens, who is an uh, architectural conservator. Kate Regev, who is an architect, a preservationist, as well as, as Mark Rakotansky, and others who join us on an ongoing basis. So let me tell you a little bit uh, so about what they teach uh, in the Master of Preservation um, curriculum. So first thing to know is that we have two different options, OK? We have a full-time option and a part-time option. I think most of you will probably be interested in the full-time option, but some of you might be interested in the part-time option as well. The main difference is full-time option is really two years. The four-time option is uh, spread out over four years, eight semesters. Um, the full-time option is intended for students who have a, a, any, any background. So we have students that are architects, of course, engineers, planners, but also people that come from the arts, from English, from philosophy, uh, from marketing, from finance, finance um, all different backgrounds. There's no prerequisite to, uh, to join the program. And it really is intended to teach students uh, the basics, the foundation for becoming a professional preservationist. So there's no experience required to, to join the program. Um, the part-time option is really meant for people who are already working in preservation. And so they have a job. They're usually in and around the, the, the large tri-state area of New York, and they, um, they want to keep that job, and they, wanna, and they are going to be part-time studying and part-time working. You must be either already a, a working preservationist, an architect, an engineer, or a planner. Uh, or, you know, we're, we're, we can look broadly. Uh, if some people have relevant experience in related fields. Um, so they might be, for example, in nature conservancy uh, and want to move over to more of an architectural preservation um, uh, direction. So you, you need to have four years of at least part-time employment in that area. So we also have dual degrees. Um, while you do your work here as a preservation uh, student, you can also be pursuing degrees in other programs. So urban planning is one of them. Uh, and I'm listing here the different, the different times that it takes to, to get through each of these programs. There's a time savings, uh, preservation and architecture, preservation and real estate. Um, when you combine the two programs, you have to apply separately to each program and you get an admission letter to each of the programs separately and you save uh, time uh, in that process. So switching now to the, uh, to the, to the meat of, of, the, of the curriculum. So uh, our curriculum is uh, what we call a slab, the slab curriculum. This is something that is particular to Columbia University. Um, and it really is a, is a curriculum based on the idea that you need to connect the dots. And you need to connect the dots in four different really important areas. Society. Uh, laboratory, so technology and science of preservation, archival history, so how to really figure out the historical importance of a building through archival work, and building, and building meaning built existing built environments. So thinking more broadly, this is an environmental question, thinking more broadly about the existing built environment and how do we intervene in it uh, how do we intervene in it uh, through uh, art, but also through architecture and engineering? We are changing the built environment when we are preserving it. So that constitutes the slab curriculum. Now we are organized in, and so in each of these categories, you can see a series of classes and those classes are feeding into studios. These are required classes. The required classes are in yellow and uh, I'm sorry, they're in blue and in yellow. And they feed into studios. So there are three studios, one for the first three semesters, and they lead to a thesis uh, 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 project at the in the last year. And that thesis project is an individual thesis project. 
So the studios are really hands-on work where you're integrating all of the different ideas uh, for, that you're learning, all the different knowledge from these different classes into a project. You're actually working on a project. So in Studio One, we work on a building. Uh, and let me just tell you a little bit more about each of these studios uh, in detail. Studio Two, uh, uh, in the subsequent slides, but stu just very briefly, Studio Two is going to look at an urban environment and Studio Three is gonna be looking at cross-cultural studios. So think, how do we work across cultures? Thesis is a very important component and a uh, little tip for all of you as you're writing your applications, we really wanna hear from you what kind of work you see yourself doing as a thesis. And it's really a way for us to understand where do you wanna go professionally? And so when you write your applications, really try to make sure to tell us about that. Where do you wanna go with your professional career? And why do you think that Columbia is the best place for you? How can we help you? What is the faculty that you find interesting? What is the resources, the laboratory, the, the, art, the libraries that you think you will be using? We want to know how we're going to be able to help you. Um, so in Studio One, we're really looking at buildings. We're learning to look at buildings, to analyze it a bit like architectural detectives, to measure buildings to study the archives of, of buildings, the drawings, the plans, to read those plans and to connect the dots between all this different kind of information. Um, that's very important because we're trying to learn the historic significance of these buildings. Now in Studio Two, we're really thinking about the community. How do we engage with the community? How do we um, map with GIS? We, we work very much um, at the forefront of digital technologies in the program. So using um, GIS to understand population density, who lives there, but also who, um, what are their values and how can we be of service to them in advancing a more just um, environment? And so um, the Studio Two also includes a component which is to actually visualize what is the preservation work going to look like and to push this idea of experimental preservation that sometimes preservation might mean a legal designation, but other times, like in the projects on the left, it might mean some light projection, it might mean some changes in the environment, it might mean like on the right, an art installation inside of a, uh, of a ruin to really catalyze and motivate the community to, to, to come forward and start saving that building. So very much hands-on, very much in the community. That is a, um, on the right, St. Luke's Church is, is in Harlem. So we're very, very engaged with, with that. Um, Studio Three, uh, is a uh, is a studio that has two is a cross cultural studio and you can have a focus either more on the experimental preservation uh, part of it it is uh, in tandem with the architecture program so it's a joint studio and then we look at things like for example this mansion which was um, the house of the John Jay family. John Jay was one of the founders of the United States of America. He was the first chief justice of the United States. He was also a major abolitionist, uh, founded the Manumission Society, but also problematically owned slaves. And all of the slave history of his site uh, has been erased. So the students worked on how to reconstruct um, this African-American history and legacy on the site. So very much looking at the history, uh, scanning, uh, we used our drones, uh, 3D scanning equipment, everybody learns, uh, it becomes uh, digitally uh, savvy and uh, educated in all the different technologies for documentation. Uh, we, we scanned all of the all of the site, and then you begin to manipulate those scans in order to make your own proposals based on a number of really deep research onto the material fabric of this, uh, of this place. So here you see students, for example, collected the, the various fragments of, of a building that was no longer there. You can see the, a picture of the building on the right, and then did some um, 
paint analysis, different kind of material identification to figure out what was the color of this building, how big was it, what was it made out of, and then propose different reconstructions that reinterpreted the site. Um, so that is one of the uh, projects. Here's, here's another one of those projects uh, by Tom Rice, who was working on how to put together a new door into the building that would actually be a door that kids could actually look through the keyhole and discover a whole new different hidden environment behind it, which was the story of African American um, uh, uh, people who lived in the house and took care of, um, of, the, of the ground people. So we also work with, uh, we also teach students how to design extensions to existing buildings. So in this studio, for example, this was a visitor center that students did. And here you have on the right is the existing carriage house at the J Center. And on the left is Tom Chu's new design for an extension to that uh, carriage house into that visitor center, where uh, when people come in, this is all a 3D model uh, designed um, by uh, Tom that uh, you know you can see the desk you know getting down to the level of details of how do you actually articulate an exhibition within a historic building a new building with a historic building um, and give this a, a design aesthetic to um, to history to helping us connect to history to helping us connect uh, emotionally to history the student the project is is the the studio three is also very concerned with sustainability uh, through adaptive reuse, we've done a number of projects where we've gone around the world and worked in U.S. embassies. Here's the one in Mexico, and students work on adaptive reuse projects for those. And when we travel, we obviously visit the cultural heritage sites and meet with cultural heritage professionals to understand how preservation is practiced in different places around the world. Preservation Studio 3, um, this cross-cultural travel studio, um, we, we, we have two options. Some, we offer the, the, the option that is a, uh, together with architecture and then the option that is together with planning. And so here, this one is taught by Professor Erica Avrami. And in this case, they went to Freetown in Sierra Leone uh, to uncover the, um, the, the history of the slave trade over here and try to understand how these places, which as you can see on the left have fallen into ruin, could be preserved. And some of these studios uh, you can download on our website as uh, various reports that have been made, always in engagement with the local community. And these reports become a way of giving back to the local community, a tool that they can use to actually advance their preservation goals. So all this work um, uh, involves a lot of engagement with a material fabric we are uh, an architecture-oriented pr uh, preservation program. We uh, teach students to preserve the built environment. Now, you know, this is different than other programs that might be more, let's say, uh, strictly policy-oriented, more on the planning side, more about, you know, how to, how to write laws uh, or programs that might be more kind of archive, um, archaeological, they might be working on dead sites, sites where people don't live, uh, you know, National Park Service sites, for example, that are really visited by tourists, um, or mm, other programs might deal with folkloric studies. So that's not us. So that's something that you really need to know. Uh, our program is organized around the living built environment. The people are in it, people use it. And so the Preservation Technology Lab is a, is a place where we advance this, um, you know, your knowledge of the material world and how it is transformed, how we need to care for it, uh, and how we do that with science and technology and aesthetics and art, bringing together art and science into the, into the lab. So students go, go um, learn to identify materials, but also um, learn to document them but, and learn to take care of them. Because one of the really important parts that we teach in our program is really to, to move. We want to move the whole world, not just preservation. We want to move the whole world 
from an ethic of what, what we think right now is an ethic of carelessness in the world and an ethic of exploitation, we wanna move that to an ethic of care because that's what preservation really uh, is about, is about caring, not just for the built environment, but caring for people. So when, for example, um, we have this student, Sung Ho, um, who is working on mortar, he is at the same time thinking about the craftspeople that are going to be using that mortar. How are you gonna care for the buildings? How are you gonna contribute to the local community by introducing a new material that is gonna reactivate you know, the relationship between people and place. That is very important for us. Um, so moving on just slightly from the curriculum, I think that for us, it's very important that we um, launch students into the world with, um, with the right support. And as students work through this exp experimental preservation, um, you know, uh, ethos and, uh, and framework, we want to support them. And this, the Onera Prize is uh, an extraordinary prize, really, that allows students to take an idea that they developed in our program and make it real. And so it, it is a $25,000 prize um, that has gone to help people start companies, to, um, to create um, you know, digital databases for communities, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, work. So it's very, very exciting uh, prize. We're very focused on getting you out there. You know, the buildings don't come to us. We have to go to the building. So, but also going to the laboratories where the craftspeople um, work, the, the, the workshops. Um, so we're constantly taking uh, field trips and, you know, New York is our, uh, our, um, our laboratory as well. So let, let's maybe pause here for a second and take some questions if any of you have some, and then I can go back and tell you a little bit more about the various um, aspects of our, of our curriculum. While you guys, um, you know, just feel free to turn on your screen and, uh, and ask whatever question uh, you have. And why you guys do that, I'm still sharing screen, correct? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Why you guys do why you guys think about it, and please jump in. I just want to show you the kind of work that some of the students have done. Um, you know, typical work of what, what we've been doing in the lab. This is a 3D scan of Avery Hall. This is this is the school, this is where we are. And we did a very fine grained um, analysis of this facade to look at just how it is decaying and what we can learn from the various um, patterns of dust and pollution that are on the facade about not just the facade, but about the climate around it. We did analyses of the various um, different um, deposits on the building to see, you know, for example, lead deposits. Lead deposits are those that, that really mark a moment in time because at a certain point, um, cars stopped using lead. So we know that if we're finding lead, we're really looking at dust from, um, you know, before the 1970s. So this is very high definition, ultra high definition scans. We collaborate with um, various foundations, in particular with the SciArc Foundation, in doing some of this um, high definition scanning, documentation, and analysis work, which is really important for how we preserve buildings. And, and the students, for example, were able to do some wind simulation here to figure out, you know, exactly how did the deposits come uh, onto onto the building. So this is just a, a little example for you of the kind of thing that you will see uh, and that you will be doing uh, at Columbia. And of course, what you're doing is you're linking this building to the people that are using it, but also to the environment that is affected by it and that, um, that we are trying to also help to preserve through our engagement with net zero technologies, adaptive reuse, and so on. 